and good afternoon all. Welcome to this session. We have some great papers, even though one of them is mine, uh, but I do think the other papers are even better. Um, we will go in the order given in the program. So I would first present my work on low wage work in Canada. Uh, then we would have Jane Parker presenting work on uh, living wage impacts from New Zealand. Then we would have David Nash from Cardiff talking about uh, real living wage in British local government. And then we would have the working hour a history by Patrick Scanlon. So welcome all. And without further ado, I shall begin my presentation and I'm urging myself and all my colleagues to limit ourselves to 15 minutes each. Okay. Now you're not seeing my slides yet, right? Okay, let me just share. Okay, tell me if you can see my slide now. Okay. Yes, you're, you're all good. We can see it perfectly. Thank you. Okay, so um, I want to share with you some exciting recent work we've done on low wage workers in Canada. Low wage, uh, there are a number of approaches to dealing with people who are not earning enough. And in fact, are, some of them are called the working poor. There's the minimum wage, which has its own problems. There's the living wage, and we have two excellent papers today, so I don't want to take any time talking about that. And of course, recent talk about a basic income or a universal basic income. So those are all ways to think about low wage work. Our approach is a little different from, from the above, but it's complementary. we like to think. So I want to share with you very briefly, a case study from a story that appeared in the New York Times a couple of years ago. And they compared two women. Both women were of color. They both worked in the US. They both worked for high tech companies. And they both worked in the same job. But look how differently their careers spanned out. So on your right is Gail Evans. She was a janitor for the Eastman Kodak company in the 1980s. And inflation adjusted, she made about 16, 60 an hour. But she was a full-time employee of Kodak and had all the benefits that went with it. Marta Ramos on your left is also a janitor and she makes about the same amount of money. And while she cleans at Apple computer, she's not an employee there. She's an employee of a subcontracted firm. And so in addition to her wage, she has no benefits, zero. And where she works, she doesn't know anybody there because they treat her like an outsider. Now look what happens to Gail Evans, who gets laid off, but because she's part of the family, Kodak will find her another job in another location. She get, got laid off a second time, and again, they, they relocated her. Finally, she started talking to the people she knew and they said to her, they said, you know, there are these evening computer courses, why don't you take them? And she had tuition reimbursement and time off from the company, so she started going to school, became an IT worker and rose to become an IT manager with Kodak. Later, she left the company and went on to become a manager in other IT firms and eventually retired, as, and as you can see from her photo, that she looks comfortably well, well off. Marta Ramos, on the other hand, was asked by the reporter, where do you think you will end up eventually? And Marta says, well, I don't see any way out of this job. I, my fear is that I will retire in this job. So this story very nicely captures our approach and an approach that we think should be part of our thinking about uh, low wage work. And that is that we should 
make a, a bridge or a, or a ladder so that people can start there, but then they can have upward mobility to move out of those jobs. So the cruelest thing about low wage work is that you are assigned to it forever, for your entire life, and you have no escape. That is more cruel than just having to do that job for a short while. So upward mobility has to be part of the solution to the strategy around uh, or, or policy around low wage work. So in this vision, uh, low wage work would be something essential uh, in society, but it would be akin to an internship. That is, you have low pay for now, but eventually you're hoping to move up. So in this thinking of upward wage mobility, what are some of the factors? And these are all taken from pre-existing studies. Uh, people have identified these factors as affecting upward wage, wage mobility. So for example, um, if you have more skill acquisition opportunities, either learning on the job or going back to school or, or getting on the job training, uh, if you improve your skills, then you can move up. Uh, more social capital, um, um, and on, from the psychological side, if you have greater self-efficacy, that you can do it, you can learn something better, expectancy that learning something would lead to a better wage, access to training, and removing barriers like lack of money and time and other resources, then all of these should predict upward wage, wage mobility. So we did a survey um, in 2019 and 2020. Uh, we collected approximately 5,000 responses um, all across the entire wage spectrum. The low wage group is from 11 to $15 an hour. And the control group, because I do some comparisons, is I use the third quartile because they are sufficiently removed from the low wage workers so that we can see the contrast, we can see the um, variance in, in key variables and we can validate our model of what causes upward mobility. Okay, here are some very brief numbers on wages and uh, they are across the entire, sorry, uh, they are across the entire wage spectrum. We divide the sample into four quartiles and in the tables I'm going to show you now, I compare the first quartile with the third quartile. So quickly again, um, there are some differences that we expected and we did find, and there were others that we expected but did not find. Um, so for example, in age, there is not a huge amount of difference. They are almost the same. Remember that we have youth, we have young people in the first quartile. So if we take out the youth, it would probably be the same. Uh, not a big difference in number of immigrants, but if you look at recent immigrants, yes, they are overrepresented in the low wage work. Visible minorities, yes, overrepresented. Women are about the same. And in education, they have less education than Q3. If you look at their household, we did not find a big difference in the size of the household and number of wage earners, but we did find a significant difference in reporting dependent care. That is low wage work people had more, they reported more dependents at home, and also they were lower in home ownership. We asked about location and what we do find is that a disproportionately number of them are uh, in rural areas. So 16% as opposed to Q3, which is only 11. And in small establishments, that is establishments less than 100. And of course their commute time is lower because they are uh, closer to, uh, or they live in small communities. Uh, in terms of industry, as we expected, um, low wage workers are overrepresented in hotel, restaurant, food service, or tourism industry, which was one group for us, and retail. And both of these facts are well known from other data. 
in terms of uh, uh, their job situation, a much higher percentage reported a, a, a stint of unemployment in, in the last uh, uh, couple of years. We did not find a big difference in uh, people holding multiple jobs, which is a fact that appears in the literature, but wasn't in our sample. We counted the number of benefits they have as part of their job and they have fewer benefits. They have lower job tenure. They are much less likely to be full-time, more likely to be on fixed term contract. And on union in the workplace, they also report that uh, only 20.8% have unions in their workplace as opposed to 32.7 for Q3. And if there was a union, are they a union member? Only 16% compared to 26% in Q3. And they work fewer hours. We asked them if they have a job where they are su uh, supervised very closely all the time and they said yes. Uh, they, but they did find their job interesting. This is a five point scale. So it was fairly high, but it is lower than Q3 and their job satisfaction is also lower than Q3. When we asked them about their intent to find another job, they are substantially higher than Q3. In other words, they know that they have a bad job and that they would like to find another job. So there is motivation. They are not low on motivation to leave the job or, or to find another job. Now, very quickly, uh, three other measures I want to share with you, and that is uh, social capital. It is alleged often in the literature that people who are poor, who have low wage jobs, they also lack social capital and hence it's harder for them to move out. But in this sample, you can see that, um, uh, in fact, the low wage workers reported talking to more acquaintances, job counselors, friend, family member than Q3 did. And I, to me, that is intuitive because uh, they are eager to escape and they're trying to find out if there are better jobs uh, anywhere else. On self-efficacy, we found no difference, which is, uh, one way of saying that, look, uh, their self-efficacy is as high as people who are making much higher wage, and therefore they should be able to succeed in uh, acquiring upward mobility. And lastly, uh, on expectancy that we can uh, find a better job if we take training, uh, in fact, they were slightly higher than um, than the uh, uh, control group. Okay, now very quickly, um, here I show you the correlations between these key variables, sorry, um, that we, I just spoke about and uh, I correlated with, did you take any training in the last uh, 12 months? And also uh, a correlation with the average wage. And here again, what we find is that almost all the uh, correlations, rather I should say all the correlations are exactly as we uh, predicted and they, in the same direction that we predicted. Uh, lastly, to end, let me show you uh, three um, regressions. We regressed these variables, age, social capital, self-efficacy, efficacy, expectancy, and wages on motivation to increase earnings, and here again, our ideas are well validated. And remember, this is a total sample. We, are, we have all the workers, low wage, medium wage, and high wage. And in the total model, we find that uh, if you improve, these are positive co coefficients, if you improve so social capital, self-efficacy, expectancy, then it would increase the motivation to increase earnings. Um, then we also did a regression on, the, have you taken a course in the last 12 months? Here again, we find the same pattern of results. And lastly, the propensity to leave your current job. And again, the model is validated. So let me 
get to the end now. I have a minute left. In my results, um, we, we do find that low wage workers are sort of trapped. I think that's one way to interpret these data. They have the wherewithal to escape. They have the necessary resources, but, but those resources are not sufficient. So it signals that perhaps they need a little bit of a, a help push from the below, from below. And if we improve access to training and if we can intervene to improve their expectancy, then they would be able to move out of low wage. Let me end by saying that um, the policy implications of this are that we need some programs that are explicitly aimed at low wage workers. Now, perhaps our colleagues can tell us about other countries, but in Canada, we have these programs, but they're always for some targeted group. For example, it would be targeted to immigrants or the chronically unemployed or the disabled workers. But there isn't a program where if you were just an average low wage worker that you could access the program. And what these results suggest is that perhaps they should create a pilot program, test it. And this, is, this will be increasingly important because in the next three to five years, we are going to see a big impact of artificial intelligence and greater job disruption in the market. And if these programs are in place, these people can take those programs and they can um, get out of that. Sorry, my timer is going off here. And uh, so let me end by saying that um, we should think of upward mobility as an essential complement to other policies uh, that target low wage work. So let me end there. And I shall now invite Jane to make our next presentation. Thank you very much, Anil. Uh, really fascinating. And um, I hope that we can uh, share some parallels and unique experiences from New Zealand. Um, kia ora, everybody. And thank you for coming along. Um, I'm just going to hopefully share my screen with you. So uh, is that visible to you all? Yes. OK, great. So um, unlike Anil's presentation, ours is um, a qualitative study, which is part of a wider study that's been ongoing for about three years in New Zealand. Uh, and it's by my colleagues uh, at Massey University and at also at Auckland University of Technology. So just, just by way of a very brief background, um, when we're talking about living wage here, we're, we're using a conception of it as not just subsistence earnings, um, but rather trying to elevate one's situation so that uh, you're in a decent work situation uh, and your well-being is, is taken into account, not just within the workplace necessarily, but also uh, in the um, domestic and other spheres. And uh, in our own studies, we try and extend this to capabilities um, human capabilities that Anil was, re was referring to both within the workplace and other contexts, so in life in general. And um, we, we're also uh, alluding to the ILO's definition of a living wage, um, which is um, one of their central tenets of uh, decent work according to their conceptualization. So in a number of um, jurisdictions, there's been renewed interest in the living wage and in particular the US and the UK and also in New Zealand since about 2012, uh, when we had a living wage movement, Aotearoa New Zealand, uh, that, that commenced and has been going from strength to strength. Um, it's an interesting uh, set of drivers for that in that we've uh, got a fairly low wage, relatively low wage context, um, relatively low product, labor productivity, uh, long work hour weeks, and quite a, a high level of um, cultural and other diversity amongst our workforce um, and also our general population. So there are a number of drivers and perhaps more positively, um, aside from things like a low wage share of national income and growing income disparity and such, we have the positivity of um, corporate social responsibility perhaps becoming more, um, more cognizant of the need to, to look at this as well. Um, so, by way of a very brief background on New Zealand, in 2017, our current Labour-led coalition government came into power, 
and soon after brought in a raft of employment law and other changes. Uh, and this was to help recalibrate power relations between employers and workers and others. And Anil was asking about um, different policies and initiatives around different groups of workers, such as the low pay. Well, this current government uh, very quickly brought in a policy to try and extend a living wage across our public service. And that has um, been fairly well instituted. Other different, uh, other things that have come into play um, include um, discussion or a, a task force that was set up to look at fair pay agreements, which would elevate uh, a number of our decentralized bargaining arrangements back up to a more centralized level, say at sector or industry level. And um, we've also had minimum wage step, step ups fairly regularly since 2017, to the extent that that, that uh, rate is actually now converging towards our living wage rate, which is setting up setting off a whole range of new analyses in terms of what that means for workplaces. Um, so with, with that kind of very, very brief background, and we've got a paper associated with this talk, if you're interested, um, which I'm happy to share. Um, what we thought we'd do with this part of the study, as I say, it's qualitative, is to look at what various stakeholders, employers, sector reps, um, employees, uh, managers, and others um, think about the living wage in terms of its impacts, and also what kind of contingencies have an impact themselves on those perceptions. So this uh, project, as I say, forms part of a, a wider project that's um, wrapping up in uh, early 2021. And we drew for this part of it on three sources of information, um, about 20 or so sector interviews, a couple of case studies. We were going to have four case studies for you today, but uh, with COVID, uh, two of the cases have been a bit delayed, but hopefully we're working through those in our field work. And we've also got from a nationally representative survey, we've extracted the qualitative comments from employees who provided some sort of um, response when asked about impacts about the living wage. All of this material was subjected to a manual thematic content analysis. So key findings, well, there's been quite a few and I'll try and uh, focus, but essentially, um, just, and I won't go through every point on the slides, but um, we're talking largely about anticipated effects, really. We have about 150 accredited living wage employers in New Zealand. And so that means that uh, people are talking about what they expect a living wage initiative to do rather than what they're experiencing. And we often see that the impacts are conceived to be linked to organizations' um, purpose or raison d'etre. So for example, when it's a large council, there are often internal and externally oriented aims around uh, implementing a living wage that might differ to say a small competitive manufacturer. Um, from our sector or national um, employer representatives, essentially what they said is that is employers are pretty much supportive of the principle of a living wage, but they have a number of concerns around its implementation linked to affordability. Um, the needs-based calculation concerns them, the official living rate, uh, living wage rate, that is, uh, in that how do they translate that to labor, labor productivity and value. So we have a tension that's coming through there. Um, other uh, factors that seem to come into play um, relate to those wider regulatory and other environmental changes that I mentioned before. And so one early effect is because we have so few examples really of the living wage accredited employer is that a number of larger corporates are now actually engaging in their own or commissioning others to, to research what a living wage might look for them. Some are moving away from the official living wage rate and actually tailoring a rate that would suit their own organizational and local conditions. Um, oops, where's that slide gone? I must have put it sorry, on a, uh, there we are. So when we look at other stakeholders, such as um, HR managers, living wage advocates, employees, uh, and, and the two case organizations I should mention are both living wage. Uh, one is using a tailored approach, the other is using the official living wage approach. And basically what they all say uh, in the round is that um, the living wage isn't a silver bullet. It's not gonna work in isolation and they're linking it to other HR and wider corporate strategies. That seems to be more effective in general. Uh, they're also much more moving away from the economic arguments to, to socioeconomic arguments uh, within the workplace around employee um, value. For example, from recruitment through to um, retention and employer reputation. 
And the Auckland Council case there that I mentioned has the tailored living wage example, uh, has certainly uh, been able to identify some of these positive effects. One of the big concerns for the council and other employers has been around um, differentials, uh, or so the ripple effect of a living wage when we're considering uh, other workers who are on a slightly higher wage and, and what this will mean for them in terms of their relativities. And also I would mention that in both of our cases, they have quite sophisticated and win-win uh, or collaborative employment relations context, which seems to facilitate the implementation and success of these programs. They also, uh, these stakeholders tend to link, as Anil was uh, referring to, um, the living wage impacts in terms of capabilities, both within the workplace for the employee, but also more widely for the employee in their life, quality of life and that of their families. And they also identified some inter-organizational behaviors. So often a living wage employer, for example, will procure from another living wage employer. And so there are some networks being developed around living wage employers in that respect. Um, and again, with the smaller case in manufacturing, it's a food manufacturer in New Zealand, very um, socially minded, um, ethically driven from procurement right through to its client um, and, and sales. They are also combining the living wage initiative successfully with a number of others, such as flexible working and so forth in a high trust collaborative environment. Okay, I won't go through these, but um, if you're interested in looking at the slides, we have a number of quotes which are indicative of the more general themes from our various stakeholders. So as you can see, um, they had quite a lot to say. And this third slide here actually focuses on the comments that came from people from the case studies and um, you'll get a flavour from those if you want to see them um, as to their views about how things are going. So in terms of looking at um, some of the contingencies that inform these percep perceptions of a living wage effect, first of all, the phenomenon itself, uh, particularly amongst employers, we're in a nation in New Zealand, it's a small economy, um, as I say, relatively low uh, labour productivity and concerns about how that's going to work, bringing in a living wage, for example, with automation and other um, job um, altering factors. With the living wages calculation, there's some concern about its needs-based basis um, from employers and its relevancy, given that we have a number of um, cultural and other diversities in our workforces and also in their household makeup. So the calculation that's used is seen as more or less relevant to, to certain households. Again, the interna unknown interactive effects of the living wage with um, other uh, organizational and wider uh, regulations and policies, and uh, that, that raft of, of wider factors that I mentioned coming into play, especially with the change of government several years ago. A number of organizational features have also fallen out of the mix is quite significant. So scale, we, we have many um, very small uh, entities in New Zealand. In fact, they probably form our industrial background, uh, backbone and uh, they're quite low margin, um, low paying and fairly unprotected. We have a, a relatively deregulated economic and labor market context. Management agency is sometimes called into question as well in terms of how much these initiatives are being driven and pushed through to affect as is the calibre of employment relations. Other contingencies we identified came out at the sector level. So we had a, a sector analysis that looked at public private and also five economic sectors. And I'm, I've just mentioned the case that we have within the manufacturing sector. Um, I think also at sectoral and regional levels, one of the important factors to note is that the sector and regional bodies that represent employers have a very um, different approaches and levels of cognizance of the living wage conversation and its meaning and impacts. Uh, and that's something that perhaps needs to be addressed so that they can better inform their members to, um, who can then in turn make their own um, informed decisions about the living wage. Regional factors include things like cost of living um, on that map there, Auckland is at the skinny bit in the North Island towards the top third. Uh, it has a much higher cost of living than other parts of the country. And so there is a question mark over whether we need to regionalize our living wage as well. We only have one flat rate for the country at present in a voluntarist system. So some implications, um, just again, selecting a few here, uh, that we need to really think about longer and shorter uh, impacts from the living wage and also to, to look beyond um, just econometric analyses to the context sensitivity of the living wage. 
And to do this on an ongoing basis, I think, is pretty important as we have a fairly dynamic context as well. What's also emerging is that, as I say, the living wage is seen by most parties as not a silver bullet on its own. So a cross policy and agency approach would be helpful. Um, and that brings into question the role of employers, whether they are um, the main determinants of implementing these schemes or just one of many players. And also we need more debate around whether it should stay voluntary uh, and as I said before, be regionalized. At the sector and regional level, again, we, we need to look at agency provision of information to their members um, and also to perhaps explore a transitioned approach uh, to the living wage, if that's going to be more palatable to those low margin, uh, more struggling or challenged employers. And of course, I'm talking pre-COVID here as well. Uh, and we expect a number of um, other contingencies to now emerge in the current uh, dynamic situation. There's also an interesting factor in that um, if you're going to go living wage officially in New Zealand, you can have your license renewed or, or not annually. And so that was seen by the living wage movement to provide some flexibility to employers who are struggling with the affordability or the perceived afford affordability of these programs. And very quickly with regard to HR um, and managers and perhaps strategies that they might want to be thinking about, this notion of um, going living wage and linking uh, the raison d'etre of a firm to its impact assessments and ju uh, judging success that way, from framing a business case of the living wage from um, an immediate cost to uh, also a longer term investment approach as shifting mindsets around that, looking for greater buy-in. We don't see many employee um, participation measures um, being adopted really around the living wage question and its um, implementation. And this has been referenced by uh, others in the country, as you can see there. And also that with our number of small organizations in this country, which have no HR function, the need for agencies at regional and, and national levels to really assist and to um, provide information about um, the, the implications of going living wage to those entities. And I've just got the last point there about um, strategizing for higher quality and caliber management and leadership, uh, which will help to provide a, dri a driver as well, according to our participants. So as I say, uh, in, in wrapping up, the living wage is broadly supported in principle, but we have a number of structural and agency constraints. Um, it's seen to have a number of positive spin-offs, contrary to something that our government put out in 2013, the New Zealand Treasury, which assessed that the main outcome would be job losses. That's certainly not what's coming through. It's a much more nuanced situation from um, the perspectives of the informants. Um, that we need to look at the living wage in context, both within the firm and beyond, and that there's much more research to be done. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing what David and others have got to say and uh, in other contexts. Thank you very much. Oh, one last thing I should say. These are some of our um, outputs, which um, draw more on the quantitative analyses and mixed methodologies. Um, very happy to supply those. And so, Kiora from Aotearoa. Okay, thank you, Jane. Thank you My for pleasure. being right on time. So you've set a good bar here <laughs> for the others. Um, okay, let's go to da uh, David, who's going to tell us okay. about the living <laughs> wage in British local government. Okay. Uh, I think let's wait for Jane to stop sharing her screen and then I can... Yes, sorry, I'm having a few That's issues. That's right. <laughs> wait a minute. Yeah, reason, your, your slide appeared very small on my screen. I don't know why. Oh, did it? Small no. country. Yeah. <laughs> Further away, maybe that's... You know. That's, that's what it'll be, it'll be distance, yeah. yeah. <laughs> sorry, I might have to have... Uh, could the uh, facilitator override it? To stop sharing screen, you can just um, click the green button at the bottom. Yeah, it's it's not showing. It. Oh, sorry, it's it, everything's gone minimized and it's not actually responding to my. <laughs> oh, um, per, try clicking on the Zoom link. Um, or sorry, the Zoom icon on the bottom of your your desktop screen. Yeah, it's it's actually not showing anything. Sorry, I'm just it's not opening anything. Your everything's gone black. Here, let me just see if I can just override that. And just stop. Sorry about this. Screen no worries. Thank you. Here we go. Thank okay. you very much. Okay. Right. Okay, David. Oh, um, 
Okay, can everyone see that okay? Yes. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, it's great to be a uh, part of the session. Shame we all obviously can't be in Toronto uh, in person, but um, there we are. Um, okay, so what this research is going to show is um, some findings of a kind of a, a sub part of a larger project um, that Deborah and uh, Ed Heary and, and I have been working on uh, for about five years at Cardiff, looking at the UK's um, living wage. And we're going to look at specifically um, the, 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 the incidence and the promotion of the living wage in local government here in, uh, in the UK. So as a kind of a brief kind of outline or kind of context really just to kind of say the, uh, set the scene that it, it, there's, there's been a long standing tradition um, or research tradition of investigating industrial relations in the public sector uh, and kind of many studies have come to the conclusion that it embodies distinctive features compared to say the private sector. And going back to kind of Beaumont study uh, sort of nearly 40 years ago, he distinguished between public sectors as good employers, which is the notion that they um, adopt uh, progressive employment practices that incorporate best practice, that they go perhaps beyond the, the, the legal minimum uh, required uh, by statute, and facilitate things like uh, joint consultation, support for trade unions, strong equality policies, support for training, those kind of, um, those kind of elements. So they have those on the one hand, and then you have the, the, the notion of model employers, the idea that the public sector organisations go beyond just being good employers and try and promote that best practice to private sector employers using policy levers like local ordinances, and we certainly see that in, in, in the North American or the, uh, the US examples, but also procurement requirements, the issuing of grants and possible tax incentives. Um, and there's been a debate kind of, you know, rumbling on about what kind of which type of public sector organizations or which factors um, embody uh, and various factors have been identified such as political contingency the idea that the political orientation of the politicians taking the decisions uh, sometimes it's individuals sometimes it's parties um, can play a role um, the idea or the notion of the kind of the dynamic between central government and more localized devolved government uh, whether policy uh, initiatives trickle down from the centre, like they did with performance related pay, for example, in the UK in the, in the, in the 1980s, um, or whether there's evidence that some of them kind of, you know, in innovations bubble up from, uh, from the bottom, from all localised campaigns. And then institutional factors typically do, uh, around the, the presence of, of uh, promoting institutions like trade unions, but more recently um, community groups, other civil society organisations. Uh, and then lastly, our economic arguments about whether these kind of good employer or model employer uh, models are uh, encapsulated or, or enacted where they're needed in, in low wage areas or in areas of inequality or poverty. So to set the scene, uh, and Jane's done quite a lot of the work for me in terms of the, of, of, of the living wage, the notion of a living wage. Uh, the living wage in the UK, again, is a voluntary wage standard based on um, re research into the expenditure needs of low-wage families. It's, it's not a subsistence wage. It's meant to in, in embody a, um, a range of kind of full economic kind of participation um, to allow people a good decent standard of living. Um, for those firms who sign up to it, it applies to all workers um, aged over 18 uh, and importantly it includes third-party contractors. Um, who work on site, so it's not just directly employed workers. Um, just for sort of just for reference, the current rates in the UK are nine pounds thirty outside London and ten pounds seventy five in London. So there is one regional variation. Um, and I Jane said that there wasn't in New Zealand. Um, and for reference, the they are substantially there higher than the national living wage, the confusingly titled statutory top up to the minimum wage. The the, the branding was rather shamelessly borrowed. Um, by uh, the then Conservative Chancellor George Osborne in 2016. Okay, so it shows that, that it, it's, it's a much higher rate than the, than, than the statutory minimum wage. So it's a fee-based accreditation model promoted by an NGO, the Living Wage Foundation, which is an offshoot of the community organising citizens movement in the UK. Um, and currently it has about 6,500 employees, uh, sorry, employers accredited. Um, they employ uh, two and a half million workers. Um, of whom about 185,000 have directly received or have directly benefited in, in the form of a, of a wage increase. 
we have quite good information about who they are because we have good research links with the Living Wage Foundation. But there's also something that we call the shadow living wage. And this is the idea that a large number of organisations seem to pay the living wage to their direct workforce without formally accrediting. And they may choose to do this because they don't want to the complexity or the obligation to pay contractors. Um, and often uh, organisations signing up to this um, is a product of collective bargaining agreements. So the living wage has become a benchmark, if you like, to um, in, in, in those collective agreements. So our research questions are, are, are fairly straightforward, given that the public, I should have said earlier, the public sector account for just 5% of uh, accredited organisations, but 37% of beneficiaries. So they are disproportionately important in terms of the benefits of the living wage so far. Um, and a large group of, the, of those public sector employers are local authorities in the UK. So the, the research questions were to find out how many local authorities pay the living wage, how many promote the living wage, i.e. perhaps embody that idea of a model employer, and what are their characteristics, where are they, and what kind of um, features do they embody? And lastly, what's the effect of those? In the, you know, do they have an effect in spreading the living wage um, amongst uh, other employers, private sector employers in their localities? And the data was, we've derived a data set of all 412 uh, local authorities in the UK, uh, which is drawn from official sources, websites, uh, publicly available data. Um, and the data on accreditation itself is, is uh, drawn from the Living Wage Foundation. So first of all, the notion of good employers, to what extent do um, local authorities in the UK pay the living wage? And I don't want to kind of uh, bore you with a, a long list or history of the kind of structure of British local government, because it's fairly tedious for us and it'll be even worse uh, for everyone else. Um, but very roughly from top to bottom, they kind of go inside, it, they increase in scale. So district councils would typically be kind of smaller scale towns and villages or kind of rural areas and the, the, the um, the lowest tier of, of, of local government uh, that appear there. Metropolitan boroughs, and London, including the London boroughs, are much larger cities and very large towns. Um, in Wales and Scotland and some parts of England we have unitary authorities, which means there is no distinction. They are, uh, there is a single tier, not this kind of dual tier um, of local government. County councils are a rather old-fashioned notion of, again, they cover larger areas um, outside the towns. And then you have combined authorities, uh, which are the kind of if you like the, the superstructures in the very largest cities, so London, Manchester, Birmingham, etc., will have kind of um, overarching kind of Greater London Authority, Manchester, the, the, the Greater Manchester um, Authority, etc. And you can see that I think the distinctive features here, they're divided by whether they're accredited, whether they pay but don't accredit, or, or whether they don't pay. Um, and overall, that the highest levels of accreditation are found in the London boroughs. Um, in Scotland um, and in these large combined authorities. Um, what's also notable in, in Wales here, you know, a large amount of, a small amount of formal accreditation, a large level of payment of the living wage, and that's because that the Welsh Local Government um, Collective Agreement um, has embodied the living wage for the last uh, four years. So there's quite a high, a variable, but quite on the whole, quite a high take up um, of the living wage, about 60% of all local uh, government uh, authorities in the UK pay it in some form. What about promoting it? We've devised um, as of a, like 10 features or policies um, that we can identify that could constitute supporting or promoting the living wage in, in the wider area uh, in, in the local authorities. And they range at the top from a, a statement of intent, which is just simply a statement on the council's website or in its official documentation saying that they promote the living wage in their local area, um, which is the most common, you could say, because it doesn't perhaps signify anything. Um, but then more substantive measures like uh, including the living wage, the payment of the living wage in desirable features in tendering contracts, um, signing up to the Unison Union Ethical Care Charter to, to, to um, which involves paying the living wage uh, in the um, domiciliary care supply chain. Um, a fairness commission, which involves kind of the, like the, the council's convening power to bring together unions, local um, community groups, uh, union, uh, so to said unions, politicians, lo local businesses to try and pr um, identify a problem of inequality or low pay and to, and to try and commit to, to solve it. Um, all the way down to rebates or incentives, sort of um, 
on, 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 on local taxes or offering to pay the accreditation fees. Uh, and a number, um, a small 10 um, local authorities have their own independent living wage scheme. So Brighton and Hove does, I think Oxford do, uh, various organisations. So the next question really is, um, to what extent do our payers also promoters? Um, and the answer is, um, there's quite a high correlation. So on average, across all uh, local authorities, the, the average number of these promoting activities is about one, but there's a huge range from virtually zero in those, in those authorities which don't pay the living wage at all, up to over three in those organisations which are formally accredited. Okay, so paying the living wage and being a part of the movement seems to be, be linked to um, the degree to which they promote it. The next question is, the next of our research questions was, to what characteristic, what are the characteristics of those promoters, of those potentially model employers? So these are all statistically significant um, differences in the kind of the mean number of um, policies that promote the living wage. And what we tend to find is that they are, pr promotion of the living wage is higher in urban locations, in areas which uh, voted remain in the 2016 uh, Brexit referendum. Um, we use this as a proxy for kind of the, the, the idea of a progressive locality or a progressive city. It's negatively related to where wages are low. So low average wages, these are wages in the, in where average wages in the area are 10% less than the national average, or sorry, you know, the national median, um, or where there's a high percentage of low wage jobs. Again, where a quarter, over a quarter of jobs are below the living wage. So they don't seem to, promoting the living wage doesn't seem to be linked to economic need. Um, it's associated, it's, it's more common where union density is higher in the area. And it's certainly more uh, common where there is an active citizens cha uh, chapter um, of local community organisers. That only applies to England and Wales because they, they, they don't operate in Scotland. In terms of the, the characteristics of the, 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 the authorities themselves, um, they tend to be large, i.e. over 4,000 employees. Um, uh, they tend to be uh, unitary or kind of more centralised as opposed to decentralised. Um, in terms of political control, much more common where um, uh, parties with a kind of a social democratic kind of outlook, so that would be the Labour Party and, and the two nationalist parties, the Scottish Nationalist Party in Scotland and the Welsh uh, Plaid Cymru, which is the Welsh Nationalist Party in Wales, if they or a combination of them have a, have, have a control of a council or an authority, then they are more likely to promote, or they promote greater numbers of, of uh, policies or measures around the living wage. And similarly, if you have an elective mayor, one of Boris Johnson's very few and perhaps diminishing number of re redeeming features is that he was an, a, 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 a vocal advocate of the living wage when he was mayor of London, for example. Okay, it's so aware of time. So the last question, the last research question about, so what, apart from the fact that living wage, in, uh, sorry, local authorities are large employers and by signing up to the living wage, they will directly affect their own staff. Does that have any impact on the wider um, living wage movement in their localities. And there's three measures of impact that we can use. The first of us, do they impact um, the accreditation of businesses? So the first measure here is looking at um, the number of, the, uh, of living, accredited living wage employers um, per thousand businesses in, in, the living, in, the, in the local authority area. And we see that there is a positive association, although we also see that it, it, it's quite low level. In terms of kind of employee level, um, impact. The, first, the, the, the middle um, columns here in terms of living wage coverage, they measures the number of employees di uh, or directly employed uh, workers in living wage, in, 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 uh, in accredited living wage employers as a, as a per thousand, if you like, of all jobs in the locality. And that's a much stronger promotion. There's a much stronger correlation here where, there are, where, where organizations or where local authorities promote three or more policies then that living wage coverage goes up. And similarly with living wage beneficiaries, so the proportion of direct beneficiaries of the living wage as a, as a per thousand of low wage jobs in the locality. Now there are methodolo methodological issues around these uh, measures, not least because it's, it's very difficult to kind of isolate jobs from em employees or workers. So for example, IKEA, which is the biggest um, living wage employer in retail is registered in Brent in East London. So all the employees will technically be in Brent, even though the jobs actually are around, um, around the UK. And, and so that 
you know, that it's quite hard to measure the impact just due to problems in the data. So just looking at the timing, hopefully I'm around uh, time. So just conclusions, we can clearly see that there's been a high adoption of the living wage in local government, but, but weaker promotion of it. Okay, and those active promoters tend to be, they certainly, they, they tend to be accredited. Um, they, they, they're more likely to be in urban high paying areas uh, with particular concentrations in Scotland and London, which is the subject of other kind of um, research that we're doing about why those areas have done particularly well. Um, they tend to be larger authorities with social democratic political control, um, less likely to be in those areas, those low wage areas where perhaps the need for a living wage is, is highest. Um, they're also seen to be situated in areas with community organisers as well. So in overall conclusion, the living wage I feel like provides some support for the notion of local authorities as, as good employers, but perhaps weaker, that there is weaker evidence for the idea that they are also model employers. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> I knew <it> was muted. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just going to share my screen. Just one second. Right. Okay. I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, not without the 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 usual. Uh, patter of mutings and unmutings. Um, so hopefully I'm not I'm not speaking into the void. Um, right. So my intention, um, speaking as as an historian, right? Someone somebody trained as as an historian of labor, uh, working in an industrial relations department today, um, was to use this paper to present a kind of fully fledged uh, analysis of the origins of what I take to be the basic unit of exactly the kind of work um, that the other scholars on this panel have described in a contemporary setting, right, the, the, uh, for, for, for low wage workers, right, the working hour. Uh, but then of course a uh, global pandemic hit. And so rather than a working hour, a history, uh, instead I can only offer notes uh, for a history. Um, so you'll have to, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll have to bear with me if there are any gaps in this analysis because um, there are, fairly profound gaps, uh, both in my you know, intellectual bandwidth at this point and also in the research. Um, so I wanna start by thinking about uh, the distinction between time and temporality. Uh, I want to try to uh, historicize and theorize what exactly we mean. I, I'm gonna minimize, I can see myself speaking and it's driving me crazy. Um, I, I, I wanna sort of, theorize and think about what we mean when we think about uh, the distinction between working time and working temporality. Uh, what is the difference, in other words, between an hour of work and a working hour? Um, and this is a distinction that's familiar, I think, to, to, to historians. Uh, the distinction between natural time, that is to say the, the, the physical force in the universe that moves you know, entropy and the, the kind of forward motion of time, and human temporalities, human ways of measuring, uh, subdividing, and explaining the passage of time. Um, and I would say it's fairly self-evident that industrial timekeeping of different kinds, uh, whether uh, through punch clocks uh, or through um, seasonal or weekly work, reflects certain kinds of temporalities of labor. Right, and uh, uh, Someone working on a medieval farm in the 13th century um, whose working life was shaped by the passing of the seasons would have a very different understanding of what working time was uh, than someone working in an Amazon distribution center in 2020. Um, and I would say the basic unit of temporality in the industrial era in the industrial era is the is the hour. Um, so one of I think the the profound changes between the pre-industrial and the industrial era in human labor uh, is the transition from a time when 
uh, work was measured in units like seasons or hours of daylight or, or uh, the passage of the sun uh, or other kinds of measurements of natural time, right? There are anthropologists who are uh, very interested in uh, looking at the many different ways that human beings have measured time uh, across cultures and across um, periods of history. Uh, and so I guess this paper represents two broader projects. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of snapshot of two broader projects. The first is a very broad historical project connected to my previous research as an historian um, to explain the connections and the affinities between enslaved and wage labor in the 19th century. And I'll explain that a little bit more in a second. Um, and second, a more specific history of hours and hourly wages as a focus for labor conflict in the area of industrialization and as a continuing focus for conflict between uh, workers and managers in the present. So in one sense, I'm speaking to a, a set of arguments in the history of wage labor uh, in the 19th century about the relationship between plantation slavery and industrial capitalism. Um, so in the 19th century, the kind of the, the, the greatest industrial, most significant industrial product of the industrialized world was, was cotton. Um, and the primary source of cotton, particularly for the largest producers of finished cotton, uh, was enslaved labor uh, by African Americans in the United States until the American Civil War. Uh, and so there's an extended debate amongst historians between, uh, to, to, to try to explain and define the relationship between plantation slavery and industrial capital. Um, and the debate has focused around, uh, I think, in some ways, a, a kind of futile attempt to create counterfactuals and determine whether or not, if, for example, the United States had not had uh, plantation slavery, whether or not its capitalist development would have happened more quickly, right? So those have been the stakes of the debate so far. Um, and I think, in general, that kind of counterfactual argument is fairly fruitless because the history that we have is the history that happened. Um, and so instead, I'm, I'm interested in looking at technologies of industrial labor, um, like bookkeeping and timekeeping. And, and I would argue that they were developed um, in some, in, in a meaningful sense, uh, within a context of enslaved labor. So long before uh, there were punch clocks or, um, long before there were punch clocks or, or, or timepieces um, in British or American or French or German factories, uh, there were very careful um, and, and, and very refined technologies of timekeeping used on plantations, both sugar plantations in the Caribbean um, and later cotton plantations in the United States. Uh, for example, George, George Washington um, conducted a series of experiments uh, where he attempted to measure the degree to which uh, the enslaved people whom he claimed to own were able to, produce, to do certain kinds of tasks under time. Right, so the, the, the idea of, of measuring time uh, in, in units of hours is not only associated with free labor, but also with enslaved labor. Uh, and I point this out to make a kind of broader point that I, I hope will be meaningful um, and that I hope will be provocative um, in, in your own research and your own thinking, that the kinds of ideological bright lines that we draw between different kinds of labor, between enslaved, sort of most notably between enslaved and free labor, um, are actually much blurrier in terms of everyday practice. So practices that we associate with kinds of labor that we mark as emancipatory or free, um, for example, like the units of, of, of hourly work are in fact rooted, or at least are often rooted, um, in traditions of enslaved labor. And so the relationship between free labor and enslaved labor begins to break down when you consider the technologies for measuring time uh, as a unit of work. Um, I'll elaborate a little bit more on this. So in the course of the 19th century, the kind of great century of uh, the rise of free industrial labor, uh, wage labor across the world, there were many schemes for emancipation uh, mooted uh, sort of from, from the Caribbean to the American South, to Brazil, to Cuba, uh, and relatively few put into action uh, that proposed that enslaved workers would be able to divide their time uh, into, 12, into units of 12 hours, or 12 hour days, um, because you know, the majority of enslaved workers uh, were working near the equator at the time where you know, the days are roughly uniform throughout the year, and so the working day was effectively from sunup to sundown, or 12 hours. Um, and schemes for emancipation posited that enslaved workers' time could be divided into free hours and enslaved hours. Um, so free time, 
there were times uh, during the day when someone who was legally speaking enslaved uh, was free uh, to work for wages with the goal of making it possible to earn their own manumission. Uh, and this scheme was attempted on uh, a dramatically large scale under the apprenticeship system uh, in Britain's Caribbean colonies after the abolition of British colonial slavery, slavery in 1834, uh, when British colonial officials divided the time of the more than 800,000 uh, freed people in Britain's Caribbean colonies into a very similar set of hourly units of free and apprentice hours. And so the working hour, the idea of the free working hour was much more clearly defined under, in, in, in a moment of transition from slavery to free labor uh, in the British Empire than it was in Britain in the 1830s. Um, British workers in cotton factories uh, or potteries or mines in the 1830s were paid uh, weekly wages rather than hourly wages, uh, a week reckoned on a kind of basic unit of uh, the capacity for a single worker to work throughout, throughout a week. So the, the unit of the working hour was much more refined, uh, ironically, or maybe tellingly under uh, conditions of enslaved labor than it was under conditions of free labor. Um, and in the 1830s and 1840s, efforts to reform the relation, the employment relationship and to, and to reform uh, British labor practices prompted dramatic fears of falling wages, uh, in part because factories had based their wages on these uh, projected units of productivity measured across weeks, uh, which were then again measured in finished goods. Um, so even as British factories were trying to reckon with uh, how to subdivide labor uh, from workers into hours, um, plantations in the British Caribbean and in the American South had already been experienced had already been experimenting with with hourly work for decades, um, and all of this was tied together, I think, by cotton. Um, so on this slide, you can see the frontispieces of two books uh, published in the same decade, um, in 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 the 1850s. Uh, the one on the right uh, is the American Cotton Spinner Ma and Manager and Managers and Carters Guide. Uh, which is a guide for uh, capitalists interested in setting up um, cotton um, production facilities, so cotton mills, uh, primarily in uh, the northeast of the United States, sort of um, with a with an eye to the great cotton uh, manufacturing concerns of Manchester and other parts of the north of England. And on the left, you can see the frontispiece of Affleck's Southern Rural, Rural Almanac for and Plantation and Garden Calendar. Uh, which is a, a guide for effectively Southern uh, American slaveholders uh, for the management of plantations. Uh, and the interesting thing that I'd like to draw your attention to with these two books um, is, and I, you know, and they're they're both readily available on Google Books if you'd like to look at them, um, is the way that each is deeply concerned with the management of hours. Right, so the 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 putative the, the sort of science of plantation management and the science of cotton factory management uh, overlapped in all kinds of interesting and significant ways. The management of labor of enslaved people had consonances with the management of wage laborers, and so the actual physical product of of cotton that tied American capitalism and, and British capitalism together, um, this this product produced in its raw form by enslaved workers and then refined by wage workers uh, was not only connected in this kind of, by, by the commodity itself, but also by a set of labor practices. Uh, and historians like uh, my colleague, Caitlin Rosenthal at Berkeley um, have been exploring the ways that, for example, plantation bookkeeping um, and, and double entry bookkeeping were innovations that began uh, on plantations. Um, and I would say actually that innovations and technologies of dividing labor also have this kind of um, mutually constituted relationship, uh, or, 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 or rather are evidence of this kind of mutually constituted relationship between enslaved and free labor. Um, cotton was also the focus of a controversy about the last hour. Uh, so Nassau Williams Sr., and I, 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 in the interest of time, I could tell you about Nassau Williams Sr. at length, but You'll probably you're probably all you've probably already switched off uh, and left the room. Um, uh, but uh, Nassau Williams Sr. was the drum and chair of political economy at Oxford, and he was also the architect of the Poor Law Reform Act of 1834. 
Uh, and he was the author of an extremely influential and often quoted essay on the accounting of profits in cotton manufacturing. Uh, and I won't go through the mathematics of it uh, for you here, not least because it would be tedious, uh, but also because in many ways, Senior's calculations were purely notional, right? He plucked the amount of capital it took to set up a cotton mill out of thin air. He imagined that every cotton mill would want to work towards a profit margin of 15%. He was, many, many of his arguments were themselves kind of invented out of whole cloth. Uh, but he argued that uh, nearly all profits in cotton manufacturing uh, were accrued to the owner of a factory in the last hour of a 12-hour shift. And so that created, in the course of the 19th century, a profound conflict over this last hour, right? And, the, the, and, and, and it made the distinction between a 12-hour shift and a 10-hour shift, and then eventually an eight-hour shift, all the more fraught. Uh, and in, in Capital Volume 1, uh, in the chapter on the working day, uh, on the working hour rather, um, Marx glosses on these ideas, uh, I think maybe a little histrionically, but it just shows that, that the idea of the individual working hour was at the forefront of both the, um, the, 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 the actual working lives of both enslaved and free workers, but also at the forefront of the imaginations and concerns of factory owners. Um, and so I, I offer you this, this image as well, uh, to show you, uh, there's a cotton mill in the background. This is from um, New England, an image from New England in the 1870s. Uh, and the proximity of the railroad is also significant. So you can see the railroad in the foreground. Um, and, that's, and that's significant, I think, uh, for the kind of broader implications of thinking about the working hour as a site for doing labor history, and also as a site for thinking about the employment relationship more broadly. Um, so there's been a great deal of historical research on sabotage, on machine breaking, uh, on combinations and the early history of the labor movement, and a lot less, I would say, about the history of clock watching as a form of industrial action. But it's significant in this previous slide that there's a railroad track in the foreground of this image of a cotton factory, because in the course of the 19th century, and this is something that I'd hoped to expand upon, um, but you know, COVID-19 got in the way, um, railway clocks and public clocks became a focus for industrial action in many 19th century workplaces uh, because they were believed to be the only kinds of clocks that set a reliable time. And so a mill clock uh, that was not directly linked to a railway clock in a visible way became a focus for worker hostility because it seemed to be a way for mill owners and factory owners to cheat employees. Um, and so I want to just conclude by, by reiterating and try, trying to reframe this idea that I think the working hour is both something that requires a history um, and that requires a history that integrates not only the rise of free wage labor um, and, and the kind of low wage labor that we've uh, discussed in the other papers on the panel, um, but also a focus on the present moment, right? When, when techniques and technologies for timekeeping of, for, for the working poor, for low wage workers is becoming more, more precise, more prying and more onerous. Um, and I think that the working hour uh, presents, I hope, uh, an agenda for a kind of interdisciplinary project that combines the histories of labor, uh, the histories of technology, um, and the histories of, of, of the employment relationship in new uh, and interesting ways. So hopefully, uh, thanks very much. Thank you, Patrick. You can hear me, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think that we um, uh, all did good on in terms of keeping to time. Now we have some uh, time to take uh, questions. If anyone has a question. And if you don't have any questions, then my uh, take is that I will give some extra time to each of the speakers to uh, um, add a few comments at the end. And uh, perhaps, uh, now Patrick, you, you said that if you had more time, you would add this last point. Do you want to just add a little bit while I see if we have any specific questions? Otherwise, we'll go to you and then we'll go to David and, and uh, Jane. And I would close out by adding some comments. Because we have we have another what we have another twenty minutes. 
Okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm not one to turn down an opportunity to, to dilate on something. Um, no, I, I just wanted to add that, you know, um, Nassau Senior is this quite famous figure in the history of political economy, the architect of the poor law reform. Um, and it's, it's often kind of overlooked that the, his name is Nassau, right? He's named after a Caribbean city. Um, and his grandfather was the solicitor general of, of, of Barbados. Um, so, you know, there's this connection, even in the personnel of the kind of very basic personnel of, of experts in the history of labor reform uh, between the world of enslaved labor and the world of free labor. Um, I, I mean, in Nassau Senior's case, it was familial, um, but, you know, the the world of the factory was also the world of the plantation in the 19th century. And so I think that his his life and his career is another example of that. Okay, now it looks like we have a couple of questions. So maybe I'll uh, go to those. Um, Brian simply said that he has a question. So I'll call on him to ask his question. But before I do that, there's also a question for Jane. And the question is from Sean O'Brady, who would like to know to what extent did employers support the living wage? And how did this vary across small or large employers across industries and what reasons were given for or against supporting the living wage. So think about that, uh, Jane. And meanwhile, let me ask Ryan to ask his question. Ryan, if you're listening, go ahead. Yeah, th thanks very much. I just had a couple of questions, one for um, David and Deborah and one for Jane, if, if that's okay. Um, the question I had for David and Deborah in your presentation, um, you seem to find strong effects of social democratic parties, of Remain voters, and of um, mayoral uh, elected mayors uh, in uh, affecting um, living wage dynamics, um, implementation of living wage. So these seem to be sort of political dynamics. Um, one thing I was curious about is if you had thought about or maybe considered looking at the competitiveness of the elections or the seats, um, you know, there's some evidence from policy implementation in the U.S. that um, under majoritarian systems where you have close races or competitive seats, um, that motivates uh, politicians to enact policies or promise policies to voters that might um, get them elected. And so one thing that I, I thought you might consider is looking at whether, you know, race, cl the closeness of the race in the UK system matters. Um, you know, that would be a story of basically accountability to median voter interest. So I'm just, I'm curious if you if you have those data and if so, if, if that might be something that you might look at. Um, and then I might just ask my, my second question to Jane, maybe after, uh, if you wanted to respond to that, then I might ask my second question to, to another presenter, if that's okay, uh, not to take up too much time, but thanks. Shall I, um, shall I go and answer that one first? I mean, yeah, you, um, you Jane, you can have um, Yeah, thanks, that's a great question. Um, and it, we, we, we do have data on the kind of the relative vote share uh, both in terms of seats, but also in terms of the percentage vote share for each of the parties in all of the local um, authority areas. The great thing about doing research in the public sector is you have great data because they kind of tend to codify and record everything. Um, we haven't looked at, we haven't analysed that in terms of the sort of running some stats. And one of the things we want to do next with this analysis is to kind of do some multivariate analysis and see which of these, you know, potential explanatory factors kind of drop out or or remains significant but I, I think you're right I think um, that where there is a certainly sort of prima facie evidence that where sort of these political races are tight um, that kind of promising things whether it be um, signing up for the living wage or things like the um, fair work commissions these things are kind of they feature quite strongly in 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 the campaign I mean Boris Johnson famously wanted to you know wanted to carry on shouting about the living wage uh, when he went into central government I mean we haven't seen much evidence of that yet, but to, to give him some excuse, he's got a lot on his plate as well. But um, so yeah, so I, I think that's a really interesting thing to look at, and certainly we, we, we do have the data, and it's something that we'll that we'll have a look at now. Uh, in okay. The Thank you, David. Uh, now let's. Uh, can I ask Jane to answer uh, Sean's question about which employers were supporting and why, and uh, if you have data on that. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your question, Sean. Um, I'll do my best. 
Um, as I say, we have about 150 or 60 accredited living wage employers in New Zealand. And the living wage convener of the movement, um, when asked to describe who they are, said, well, they're quite a mixed bag. So perhaps somewhat surprisingly, a number of them are quite small entities. I think that they anticipated that it would be larger corporates and so forth that would come on board and be the mainstay of the accredited employers, but that's not been the case here. And when we talk to some of our smaller case study um, informants from small um, manufacturing uh, bodies, for example, or employment, they, they suggested that it may be just simply uh, factors such as the simplicity of bringing a living wage implementation into a small workforce of 30 to 40 people. And they could imagine in other entities in manufacturing that were larger, for example, that might be much more complex and difficult and need to be uh, staggered in approach. So the logistics were one factor there. So when the convener said to us that uh, it was a mixed bag, um, those who did nonetheless stand out as accredited employers uh, were councils, as, as David's um, highlighted in relation to the UK, um, NGOs and not-for-profits, as I say, the small, small uh, entities, but not the large corporates. That said, at the time of the interviewing, um, the convener was actually uh, in talks with about five large corporates, so she had a feeling that things were shifting into that area. And the larger entities are those that tend to be the ones that are engaging in research to see if they can assess the affordability or otherwise of the living wage. Now, our, our analysis, and sorry, I didn't have time to go into this today, um, but in the paper, which I could send to you, we do look at uh, five economic sectors, and you'll see some differences there between farming, farming, retail, tourism and hospitality, aged care and manufacturing. And there are a number of contingencies that reflect sectoral specificities that I think are key to whether employers are really, go, you know, have a propensity to go living wage or not. Um, Obviously, with COVID, um, just you know, as a bit of a caveat now, I think that um, with a number of uh, organisations going to the wall, for example, in our service sector, as well as in other areas, um, that's going to change the, the rules of the uh, engagement to some extent, and, and who knows how long that will rumble on for. But um, not dodging it, but very happy to give you the paper to, to give you more specificity on that. I hope that's helpful. Okay, uh, Ryan, do you want to ask your second question? Uh, sure, and I'm sorry to, to dominate the questions here. I, I just uh, wanted to ask Jane a question about the New Zealand experience. Um, I'm just curious if you think that the living wage story in New Zealand is driven more by sort of the imposition of rules by political actors on the employers, or is it more that the employers are sort of choosing to voluntarily adopt these good practices irrespective of what the political um, rule makers uh, are doing? So. I think about like what would have happened maybe in 2017 if Winston Peters had formed a coalition with National instead of forming a coalition with Labour. Would that have changed the the sort of um, evolution of living wages in New Zealand, do you think, or are these things operating independent of the sort of political parameters at play? Right, yeah, great question. Um, from um, broadly speaking, our respondents did indicate that with the change of administration in 2017, that this um, expedited the adoption of a living wage um, in some cases. And it also, I think, amongst employers, certainly brought the conversation much more centre stage because you have a context where the government has brought in a policy to have a living wage across the public service. So it was certainly much more in the employer's eye than it had been. And the conversation, as I say, came from sort of left field right into centre stage, no pun intended. Um, so I, I think that that was a factor that probably has helped to encourage um, developments. That said, um, other factors come into play as well. And I think that, you know, things like brand um, enhancement, employer brand and um, reputational capital have been a, a feature uh, to some extent in the adoption of the living wage. And certainly those who have gone um, and got accredited do get a lot of profile in this country from the movement as well, which they suggest has had spin-offs in terms of, um, you know, the, the economics of their firm, if you like. So uh, I think it's combinatory, the factors that have encouraged it. Um, I, I take your point that if we, if we maintained or had a more national um, administration, then we may have seen a slowing. Um, and we also have a context of re-regulation of certain other employment rights as well <clears throat> that have sought to, as I say, recalibrate 
worker um, protection and rights uh, in, in the labour market in New Zealand. So yes, I do think that has a bearing, the extent to which is probably something that would be really interesting for future research. Great, thank you. Thank you. I have a very quick question for uh, both uh, David and Jane, and that is, could you give us an estimate from your countries of what fraction of the public sector workforce would be covered by these arrangements? Is it, are we talking about 10 or 20% or is it 80 or 90%? That's um, the short answer is I, I don't know. It would be closer to the first. It wouldn't be um, universal. I mean, I think we, the, the figures are figures are that 60% of local authorities pay the living wage. So it depends what you mean by coverage. So technically all their employees are covered by the protections of the living wage. Um, but in terms of the percentage of their employees which have received a benefit because they you know that their, their wages were previously below that level, it's much much lower. Um, you know there is it's more common in 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 the private sector. There is a, also a phenomenon where overall across those six six and a half thousand employee employers, about thirty percent of them had report no uplift. I .e. they were already meeting that their lower wage rates were already compliant. Um, and there's a debate around whether that means that organizations are simply kind of box ticking and trying to seek the reputational advantage without incurring any costs. The kind of the, the, the mitigation factor against that is that some organizations feel like preemptively increase their wage rates to make themselves a compl you know, compliant before they join. But um, so in terms of in overall employee coverage, it would be fairly high in local government. But um, in terms of the benefit, the, the proportion of the overall workforce benefiting much, much more, probably 5%, something like that, I would guess. Yeah, thanks. Um, again, I, can, I can't give figures. I can't even give the figures that David's given, <laughs> but I can give impressions. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, certainly, um, the, the rollout of a living wage policy across the public service has been quite extensive and that has applied to those obviously at the low paid end of work and um, it, it's had knock on effects in terms of what does it mean for those who were already earning above the living wage in terms of relativities and I think there's been some challenges around that. Um, but I have to say that it's it's been a really interesting time, not just for living wage developments in New Zealand, but but other pay related um, measures as well. So we've had a swathe of pay equity settlements in the last few years from about 2014. And, and those have tended to be focused within the public service and made quite had quite a ratcheting effect as well on other um, sectors within the service. So um, a number of our respondents and informants did talk about um, the implications of that, particularly for those who are low paid, which uh, tends to have a concentration of women, Maori and Pacifica, um, and an intersectionality of that kind. So um, I think that you'll, you'll see um, it's, it's obfuscated again what the actual impact of the living wage policy in the public sector has been because you've got that pay equity settlement factor as well. But also, um, and I'd just like to flag this up because it's gone a little bit off the boil over here. We have, um, we had that task force set up a few years ago um, that looked at setting up fair pay agreements, which would operate at industry and sector level. And one of the big implications of that was that um, it would probably encourage more multi-employer collective agreements or MECAs again. We've been very much um, dealing with individualized employment relationships and contracts in New Zealand. So if that it comes to um, fruition and there is widespread support, although um, employers are balking at the idea of it being mandated as they balk at many mandated things in this country. <laughs> um, that, that too could have an impact in terms of um, the interactional effects with the living wage. So um, I can't give you figures. I could certainly try and find out if you're interested um, about uh, the spread of the uh, policy in the public sector for you, but um, you can see it, it's quite contextualized. Well, thank you. On that note, perhaps I can make a, a brief comment before we end. I think we have another three minutes to go. Is that, um, you know, there is a debate um, when you look at the private sector about whether a code of conduct is effective if the industry adopts it by itself, uh, a, a sort of self-regulation um, 
as opposed to it being mandated. And uh, I can't help but draw a parallel between that and the living wage movement with, in the public sector, where you are saying to governments that look, now um, smarten up, pay these people better, and uh, there's no requirement, but we think that you should pay better. And um, it would be effective if it spread quickly and became the norm. But as long as it remains confined to a smaller share of the total, then um, you, you wonder what else we need to uh, cover other people who are not currently covered by this. Um, do you have any thoughts along those lines? Um, yeah, I, I think from our perspective, the living wage, both as a whole, but also in, in, in the, the, the public sector, you know, as, as you're right, it can only be seen as a supplementary form of worker protection. It's it is such that it will never, well, it's very difficult to envision it kind of in, in, in covering the, 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 the amount of people, you know, I, I think the estimates are that the living wage campaign as a whole has, has, has uh, affected about 6.5% of low wage workers in, in, in Britain. So, you know, its scale in taking the whole like that is, 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 is much smaller and it, and it has particular um, difficulty in reaching those low wage sectors, you know, hospitality, retail, um, cleaning, social care, etc., where low wage is, is endemic and part of the business models, if you like. Um, I think our interest in looking at local government is that it was a kind of an area, both in terms of its kind of, it has potential, especially if to the extent that they try and diffuse the standard beyond it, their own organisations in, 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 in their local areas. But there are particular kind of hotspots of, of living wage activity. Local government is one. In the private sector, there are certain industries and certain regions, and as we alluded to in the presentation, you know, London, Scotland in particular has been has a, has a much higher proportionate rate of accreditation and living wage activity than other parts of the UK. And, you know, and, and you can trace reasons for that. Part of which is sort of devolved governmental support and to, from the Scottish national government in terms of funding the campaign and funding organisers to go out and recruit new new firms but um, there, there are those those differences at kind of either industry or ge geographic locations which which make which warrant kind of more investigation but overall I think yes it's certainly it shouldn't be seen as a silver bullet or a panacea to low pay um, you know the statutory forms of regulation are always going to by them by their nature or, 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 or collective agreements alternatively are going to hit large numbers of people uh, potentially so that it, but it can be seen and I think it's incorporation into other forms of regulation it has a, it has affected debates in government around policy uh, right now not least the fact that they, they stole the name um, but also um, in terms of you know it being incorporated into joint regulation to the extent that that then therefore the, the the influence of the living wage movement may be greater than than just those 185,000 workers who've received a pay increase in the UK Okay, well, thanks. Uh, I just uh, got a, a bling on my, on my iPhone, which says our time is up. So I want to thank uh, the presenters. But before we go, I want to recognize uh, that Deborah Han has been on the line, who is a co-author with David. And um, we, I also forgot to call out Courtney Coble, who is uh, my co-author on the first paper. She was also on the meeting, so thank you both. And thank you, Jane and David uh, and Patrick. Uh, and now the next session start in 15 minutes. So it was nice seeing you all. Goodbye. Thank you for thank sharing, Bye-bye. Cheers, everyone.